is a conversation about the rights of a group of people to vote. It traveled all the way to the Supreme Court. The first round, they lost. Today, a final nail in the coffin of the Seoul area residents in the Oti region, represented by Techuchikata, who again have lost a significant uh, uh, you know, case in the Supreme Court today. And it's about their voting rights, the final verdict, and the questions of justice that we'll be looking into tonight uh, with those who have an interest in this matter and been following it very closely. What do we know? The Supreme Court has today affirmed, uh, as we know, its uh, earlier decision that the whole High Court uh, and when it granted an injunction against the gazetting of John Peter Mew as Hohoi Member of Parliament. And you remember when John Peter Mew was in fact uh, elected, it was a shock to many. And then it emerged that that may only have been possible because the Seoul residents were not part of the voting, because the Electoral Commission had acted the day before the elections to say they cannot vote in the parliamentary but only the presidential that of course was the subject of a significant protest which ended up uh, at the courts now the first respondent uh, from uh, as we know the relief sought by the applicants in the expert application were to restrain the first respondent from seeking to gazette the uh, third respondent as duly elected mp for the whole constituency that is John Pitamu uh, from being gazetted. We know that after the time that this was granted, it has already been gazetted. Now, that came up at the Supreme Court, by the way. Also, that the first and second respondents uh, from presenting the third respondent as duly elected to represent the people of Hohoi constituency in parliament from January uh, to, of course, all the way in the next uh, four years. They had argued that because they were disenfranchised, he was not represent, representing them, and the question about legitimacy arises. Now, the third respondent, again, one of the key things we're asking for is to restrain the third respondent from presenting himself and holding himself out as a member of parliament. We know that we've gone way past that now. He's been sworn in, he's a member of parliament, he's acting, he's even been appointed a minister, but the case didn't die because it's still raised, was in the issue in, in court. What were the issues? Now, these were the issues, if you haven't followed. It's a pretty unique case in the way it, was, it came about. And that's why we are spending some time to look at it tonight on the back of the later Supreme Court decision. Now, it, it, some residents of the, and the Sol, by the way, it's a short form of San Trukufi, Akpafu, Likpe, and Lolobi. Uh, in short, Sol, it took then the Hoho MP elect John Pitamewu and the EC to the High Court. And those were the release that they were asking, that I told you earlier. They contend that by not being allowed to vote in the December 2020 elections, uh, parliamentary elections to be specific, their rights have been breached. It's a case of fundamental human rights uh, for them. Now, they secured a 10 day injunction at a time that, of course, present, prevented you know, the Gazette of John Pitamu, which subsequently elapsed. Now, the current Attorney General now filed an application at the Supreme Court urging it to restrain the whole High Court from hearing the matter and quashing its earlier uh, decision. Now, according to him, the Seoul residents do not have voting rights in Hohoi because Hohoi is voter region and the Seoul area fell in the Oti uh, region when the two regions, when that region was split into two, Oti and the Volta region. Now, the Seoul residents then filed a review after the Supreme Court had said, well, the High Court that granted an injunction erred. They insisted that the original panel committed errors of law. That is Shikata making his argument in court. The seven-member panel, I mean, the first was five members, uh, five-member panel. The seven-member panel uh, today sat on the matter and rule that the, the request for review fails to meet the threshold, threw it away. In fact, it reaffirmed the decision of, the, of, of, of their earlier colleagues uh, who are sat on the matter in this, in this particular review. So what's the background to this whole controversy that we're about to look into? Now, there's a CI that created the Guan District, which matured on November 6, 2020, paving way for the creation of the new district. Here's a problem. 
The Guan district is made up of the Santro Kofi, Pafo, Likpe, and Lolobi. Now, that in short, Saul was originally, and this is the problem, was originally part of the Hohoi municipality of the Volta region, but was then included in the Oti region upon the creation of the six regions, you recall where we went to the um, referendum, right? Now, but there's a problem in the constitution which poses very unique uh, challenge to the people there because Article 47.2 provides that no constituency shall fall within more than one region. And we had that in the case of um, the people of, of Saul. So Saul was then originally part of the Boem constituency, but with the creation of the new district, the EC was under obligation to create a new constituency to give the people representation in the eighth, eighth parliament. A very unique case indeed. Now, and then on December 6th, and this is where many of the critics had, had pointed to, the timing of it was too late to remedy, right? And to allow the people to actually vote and give them to, so that they can enjoy their right to vote. Because the EC acted on December 6th, this is just a day before the elections, issuing a statement directing that the eligible voters in the Guan district could only take part in the presidential elections but cannot vote in the parliamentary uh, elections. So on, the December, on December 22nd, they, they filed a petition uh, uh, to the Speaker of Parliament, right? Because of course, this is representation. This is a, it's their right to be represented. They filed the petition to the Speaker of Parliament, Michael Quay, uh, quoting his support to regain their right to be represented in the next parliament. And, and this is where I ask the question. I mean, on the back of this final nail, in, in, in the coughing of the, of the soul matter, as, as far as a legal uh, route is concerned, is there a route through parliament itself to get some redress for the people? After all, we've seen a petition by the minority for an investigation into the uh, violence of 2020, a petition that, again, they are pushing for, for a reopening of the case involving the closure and the revocation of licenses of two banks. Can the minority side through Parliament, push for some parliamentary intervention in this particular area. Um, I have the people to look into this. Is, is this the end of the road, or there are other alternatives to seeking redress to this particular matter? We'll delve into this. Stay with me here on PMS. After the break, my guests uh, will. And thank you very much for uh, staying with us here on PM Express uh, as we look into this matter. Um, joining me right now via uh, Zoom is Professor uh, Stephen Kwekwaza, uh, CDD Fellow in Public Law and Justice. Uh, he's been following closely this matter uh, since its inception. He's written quite a lot about it. Just follow him on his Facebook uh, page and you'll find out what I'm talking about. Uh, also joining me is uh, Franklin Kujo who is the uh, founding president of Imani Africa and uh, joins me via Zoom. And, and from what I understand, Franklin, you are a citizen of, uh, of one of the areas uh, concerned. Which is it? Is it Lolobi or Akpafu? Ak I'm part of this, I'm Akpafu as well, so. Oh, I see. Okay, great. I think so, nice to have you um, join us. Uh, Kofi Adams is member of parliament for the Boem constituency, as I elaborated there. Uh, his constituency um, was almost caught up in the middle uh, between Hohoi as well as to what to do, where to place them. As it is now, it, it is all clear that the EC must create a new constituency for them. But uh, Ms. Adams, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's been a while. I like your new office. Um, it's been a few. <laughs> it's been a few a few weeks of uh, of enjoying your new status as a member of parliament, and I'm pretty sure you're enjoying it. Of course, but the people of uh, Lulubi, Akpafu, the South area, unhappy. Are you surprised or pretty much expect, expected the outcome of today's uh, verdict by the review panel? Um, I must say it's been a difficult uh, situation analyzing this whole South issue uh, from constitutional perspective and then also from political and even human rights uh, perspective. And my focus will be much more on their rights as citizens of this country and people who deserve to be, to be, to be heard. And I say so because 
the OT region was not just created overnight. The OT region has since 2019 been created. More than a year before we went into the general elections. And clearly, government and its officials and electoral commission know very well the provisions in our constitution, especially Article 47.2 that you earlier alluded to, that you cannot have one constituency that will fall within two regions. So every step truly needed to be taken to create a constituency for the people of this four traditional area. The attempt whatsoever to try to say <laughs> they were adding them to boom, they were doing this, is, is cannot hold. This is because the Buem constituency have been same since 1992. Mm. It is not a constituency that have seen any real demarcation, either by division or addition or anything. When we started 92, Buem and Biakoye used to be under Jasikan district until the Biakoye district was created, and therefore the Biakoye constituency left Jasikan district. So you cannot move four traditional areas to come and join another as constituency that have existed from 1992 that has reached a stage that itself should be divided, possibly into two, that you are adding them to become one constituency. That should not be any option that electoral commission or anyone who wants to be fair and just should be considering. That is where I worry. Why we have to wait till 5th December 2020 to issue a letter giving indication that they were not voting in parliamentary and voting in presidential. So if you ask me that, was I expecting this? Yes. If you are looking at from Article 47.2, uh, it's a difficulty. But if you are equally also looking at legal position, because the argument from the people who went to court is that the CIA even want to eat itself, which the current attorney general, then deputy attorney general, relied on is unconstitutional and that did not follow the due process that a CIA is supposed to follow. So per their understanding, the CIA which created the whole constituency including South area, is still the valid uh, 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 CI. But in all this, it's really something very difficult to analyze, and I'll leave that for the constitutional experts to do so. But I feel that the people of South, Sandro Kofi, Akpafu, Likpe, and Lolobi, have been let down by all the senior persons who gave them every promise, indeed, including the president himself, from what I got from chiefs and other senior persons from this area in my engagement with them, that they were given all the assurances that a district will be created and a constituency will equally be created for them. Yeah. It was upon that that they went all out to accept to even partake in joining uh, Otiriji, even though I must say that the Akpafu traditional area and significantly also the lobby did not participate in huge numbers in the referendum. Turnout was very low in these two traditions because they, they disagreed in terms of their being asked to join the OT region right from the word go. But Sandro Kofi and Lipe were, were okay with, with it. And so you could observe that turnout in these two traditional areas was quite high. But we have crossed that bridge as far as I, I from where I look at it. Yes, I mean, and, 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 and Kofi, or... Kofi one, of the, one of the things that I, reason why we brought you in, and I'll come to that as I go to uh, that quickly before, because I know you had to go to the floor, is the petition the speaker at some point. It almost uh, makes the point that they believe parliament has a role to play 
in resolving the matter. Now that the legal road has ended with the Supreme Court, um, I wonder what is it that, as a member of parliament now, um, you can do uh, through parliament to get them some redress. Stay with me. I'll come to that question to you shortly. But I want to bring in Professor Kweku as our prof. So they, we've, I, I, we, I've just finished reading the first uh, judgment by the, uh, the Supreme Court. Today's uh, review judgment, we are yet to get the full details of, but it affirms the earlier one, but there are some intricacies there. I mean, would, would you say, though, that strictly looking at it on the basis of, of law, it appears to me the substantive matter of their rights to vote hasn't been addressed. Um, we, it's more procedural issues that has been used to determine this case. Is there still some hope for the people of Saul, or this is the final nail in your coffin? Uh, no, no, no. It, this is not a, a nail in the coffin at all. It, that, there's no coffin, let alone something being nailed. Uh, the fight for the rights of Saul to be in parliament has not even started. And so to talk about the end of the road is rather premature. I believe uh, the Hoi Hoi issue was a legal frolic of no consequence with respect to the issue, you know. So what the Supreme Court was deciding was whether or not uh, the injunction issued by the whole high court should be allowed to stand. And the Supreme Court quashed that injunction and the review panel affirmed that injunction. But that injunction, in my mind, if you look at the current state of the law, was needless to start with. You, you, they are not attacking the right problem and what is the right problem? The right problem was that on December 6, 2020, the Electoral Commission issued an unconstitutional directive to the people of Sal, stopping them from voting. And as a result of that unconstitutional directive, the people of Sal are currently in a no man's land they are not seated in parliament in violation of all the fundamental rights that we cherish, the right to vote, the right to be represented. And that is the problem that we need to fix. That's the problem that we need to fix. And there's an easy solution because if you look at the Electoral Commission's directive of December 6, it promises um, Sal a new constituency, the Guan constituency. So the question then is, why after the promise of December 6, and here we are in March, almost going to April, the Electoral Commission is yet to act in uh, activating this uh, constituency, laying down the, laying, uh, the CI in place so that the people of San Trophy can go and vote. Now, People would say, well, once a new parliament is inaugurated, you cannot create a constituency for an MP of the new constituency to go and sit in a parliament that predates the creation of the new constituency. And that is correct, but it's correct ordinarily. Ordinarily, when everyone in the country belongs to a constituency, then you cannot create a new constituency and elect a new MP to go and sit in a parliament that predates the creation of the new constituency. But we are not in an ordinary time. We are in an extraordinary time where the election manager, by, his, by its willful conduct, by its negligence, by its, in my mind, recklessness, extreme recklessness, has created a situation where a group in the country is not seated in parliament. Everywhere else in the world, this will be a big crisis. I mean, the whole government machinery will be shut down because people are committed to the constitution and people are committed to the right to be represented. It is not a proper thing for us to elect 
a parliament and say that some group are not to be seated in parliament. Let's go back. When you look at the Jate case, there's a case called Jate that was determined by the Supreme Court in June 2020. And the Supreme Court warned the EC of this crisis and advised the EC to create a new CI which relocates Sal from Hohoi to the OT region because of Article 47 that you so aptly described. And the Electoral Commissioner or the Electoral Commission responded by creating CI 128. CI 128, I believe, uh, was the Gazette date was 8th July 2020, and it came into effect on 11th August 2020. And as required by the Constitution, it divided the whole country into 275 constituencies. Every group of people was included in some constituency. There was no exclusion whatsoever. The rate of elections were issued and everybody was set for an election on December 7th. Then for unknown reasons, unknown reasons, on December 6th, the, C, uh, the Electoral Commission issues a directive saying that a group of people who have been assigned to a constituency should not vote. Now, let me uh, frolic a little. This whole idea that a law of the country can be set aside by a directive, by a fiat, we are getting too much of that. If there is a law of the country, the only way to amend the law or otherwise revise the law is through the exact process by which the law came into being. You cannot undo a CI with a directive. You cannot undo an LLI with a fiat. We had this same problem with the General Legal Council in 2015 when they issued, when they issued a directive, a fiat, that basically undid LI, uh, the LI that allowed every uh, uh, LLB student to go into the law school. We fought them for almost two years in the Supreme Court. We won that case. The Supreme Court was very clear, you cannot undo a law by fiat. Here we are in 2020 on the eve of election, the Electoral Commission decides to undo its own CI with a fiat. Now that fiat is illegal, it's unlawful. <laughs> People should be held accountable. You see, the reason why in our country it's so easy for people to violate laws over and over again, there's no consequence of violating the law. People are harmed. They are not compensated. The person who violates the Constitution is not held accountable. Life goes on. We need to change that culture. If you willfully violate the Constitution, that is a violation of an oath that you've taken. All public officers take an oath to abide by the Constitution. And so if you, uh, just by directing, disenfranchise people, well, not only should you be held accountable, but we are now in an extraordinary environment. And that extraordinary environment calls for extraordinary solutions. And in my mind, the extraordinary solution is the one that I've been recommending on since December 6th, immediately I saw the directive, I said, this is a problem, solve it. I asked and other people, uh, my good friend, Kwesi uh, Prempe was one of them, uh, several other people added their voice, look, you've created a problem. So organize an election in one constituency immediately, take extraordinary steps to lay the CI and organize the election for them because that's what you promised them. Isn't it too late now? No, it's not too late. That's why I'm saying ordinarily it will be late because the reason it will be late ordinary is that everybody belongs to a constituency. Yeah. But where you have created a problem and you have disenfranchised some people in the country, you cannot say, well, it's too late now, so you, you guys uh, should give it to God. No, why should we give it to God? Are we Ghanaians? Do we have full rights? If we are Ghanaians and we have full rights, nobody's negligence or recklessness should disenfranchise us. 
the, I mean, this, and, and that's why I said the uh, uh, Huawei matter was a frolic because this is the issue that should have been sent to the court. Yeah. How do you fashion an extraordinary remedy so that the people of Sal will be allowed to participate in an in a, in a special election yeah, held I, I, in a Guan constituency? Prof, I want you. I'm to, surprised. Prof, I want that, you. To, Prof, I want, yeah, to stay, I want you to stay with me because I want to bring in um, uh, Franklin on the point you just made. Franklin, I know you, you uh, at times even went to court. Do you agree with the Prof's point that, you know, the, the injunction bid and everything was, as he puts it, a frolic and that the real fundamental issue had been left uh, not attacked? Well, um, I, I think he has a point to the extent that the emergency nature of the the dereliction of duty of the EC uh, should have been dealt with uh, immediately. But I also suspect that, um, you know, Prof just mentioned the issues about the CI 95, which as of June 2020, the Supreme Court had directed the EC to ensure that the SAL areas were quickly taken out of the Hawaii constituency. Now, you didn't do that. So maybe by way of uh, strategy, there was a need to make a point that that whole, the conduct of that election was illegal to the extent that these four areas were excluded on the eve of an election by fiat, a very unconstitutional fiat. So maybe by strategy, um, it was important to deal with this particular matter first, because you see, um, at least that preceded I, I mean, in terms of the order of things, uh, that if that had been dealt with as far back as June 2020, we wouldn't have this odd situation. Of course, the optics of it would have meant that uh, Amehu says that he's a beneficiary of an illegality and so cannot be blamed, uh, also played out. So there was some bit of the politics, which I suspect uh, the courts were actually looking out for. In fact, the court didn't make a statement to that effect that Amehu is not responsible for what happened. But the court fell short of saying that the illegality had been conducted. And you see, that's where the, the challenge of um, what comes first uh, uh, actually uh, comes up right now. Because the point was, you had to deal with a more present and clear, clearer danger, which has been occasioned, uh, and then these matters of organizing elections, because he had also believed an, an elected body, sorry, a constitutionally created body, which, is, which has become a monstrosity, really, in disobeying rules. So it looks as if the first point of call was to get to the courts to ensure that what the Supreme Court ordered had not been done. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So maybe in the characterization of uh, Prof's um, prof, uh, maybe that was some sort of peradventure, but I, I think that we were in court because we wanted to make the point clear. A number of things had happened which were illegal. The CI was not properly, CI 95 was not done with. So as we, even as we speak, the whole constituency somehow con constitutes the four areas, includes the four areas as well. Then you have the other problem of the in the course of the ruling, I mean, you, kept, you had some of the, the justices suggesting that, well, the matter of uh, the right to vote was, uh, was, a, was under the direct principles of state policy, and that the whole High Court needed to determine whether it was a fundamental right or not. Again, that was another point that we thought was a bit hard to take, because uh, it's established clearly that the right to vote is a fundamental right. But of course, judges may decide to depart. Then there was a thorny, another thorny issue concerning the creation of the SAL, sorry, the, the, the so-called SAL district. You know, I keep saying it's a so-called SAL district because by LI 212151, the district has not properly been created. Because you see, when they created the, this, the, 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 those districts that were created alongside these four traditional areas. They were described as four traditional areas. If you look at the that particular ally, it states that the areas of Santo Kofi, Apafu, and Lipe, and Lolobi are traditional areas, and they are not being characterized as districts. So 
I think the legal strategy was that, look, a number of things have been done which were wrong, which you thought could seek, we could seek clarification in court. Um, I, but, but, but upon hindsight, of course, I yield now that I think maybe we should have been pursuing two things at the same time. Yeah. Make sure that. And I, I, guess, I guess for me, the question then, then becomes, I mean, now that this journey has ended with a review, will you pursue that other angle or, uh, or angle that Prof suggests? Well, I mean, it's been in the works. Um, I think there's been a petition to Parliament. Uh, and as I understand, uh, we would have to regroup again. Uh, the whole matter is still being pursued because that ought to be done conclusively. Uh, but I think we should appeal to the, not necessarily appeal, uh, uh, tell the EC to, to, to do the right thing and get the constituency or get the areas um, having their elections and having their elected representative. So we'll pursue that as well. Uh, but as you realize, lawlessness is uh, now celebrated in most of our, uh, some of our jurisdictions uh, and indeed in the courts. So that's another matter that I suspect we'd have to think. I, if you look, that matter would drag to the, to the kingdom. Yeah. It's not going to happen in court. I'm not saying that the courts are not fair, but from what I've seen so far, my diffidence levels in the courts have risen to the levels that I, I, I can't even imagine anybody taking a serious case to some of the courts that uh, we have today, especially on crucial matters of exclusion. So yes, we would appeal, and possibly if the EC doesn't do it, we we'll petition for the EC to be removed uh, and pursue that also with Parliament. Yeah, I mean, I need to come back to the Parliament question because that petition that was filed to Parliament was in the previous Parliament. And as the members of Parliament will tell you, once that life of Parliament expires, because it, I think it was to Peter Mike, uh, Michael Quay, Professor Michael Quay. Once the life right. expired, your petition to was dead with the old parliament, which means that if you want something to be done up with this parliament, you have to file a different petition. Well, I don't know which ones you're referring to. I mean, because we, at least we've had representation with the Speaker of Parliament who has promised to make sure that the SAL issue is corrected. You mean, you mean uh, Bagwin? Yes, Bagwin. Okay. So, uh, um, so I'm sure there are steps to steps being taken to to to, to do this uh, to do this as well. I see. Let, let me bring in um, uh, Kofi Adams um, for a final thought on this because he has to take leave of us. If I will be crossed over to Parliament shortly, but Kofi, he, here you are. You, you have um, um, Franklin saying, "Well, Parliament is an option for them." You are a member of Parliament. Uh, what's your commitment on this matter? Sure, Eva. This is a matter I've raised. A number of times on the floor of the house uh, when we were debating even the state of the nation address i really focused on that and wondered why the president was very silent on such uh, an important issues such as the rights of citizens of this country i have equally engaged the speaker on this matter and i know i was proposing that uh, we could come under article 298 to help in resolving this matter. Because you see, it is for the interest of electoral commission itself that this is done. Because if it is not done as quickly as possible, look, people of the South area, anybody there can initiate a process against the commissioners of our electoral commission for their removal, for the relation of duty. Because one, if you claim that the CI 128 is constitutional. It meant that the people of SAL, you claim, should be under BUEM constituency. Why did you stop them from voting through a fiat? Mm. If it is also proven in court that it is unconstitutional, then you have to move quickly to create a constituency for, for them so they can vote. And I'm talking about so they can vote in because the 47 2 that you read, which earlier talked about uh, a constituency not falling within two regions, when you go further to uh, uh, 47 6, it talks about where the boundaries of a constituency get reviewed, it will come into effect only upon the dissolution of the existing parliament. But in this case, like Prof said, they did not take part 
in an election, in the general elections. So what it means is that they do not have a representative as we speak now. So how do we resolve this issue? Article 298, that is the residual powers of parliament, parliament. is where parliament I think course. we can find comfort. And so electoral commission, the people of SAR and parliament will have to be engaging to see how quickly, possibly, when we return, by the time we return from this uh, 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 break from this session, a CI should be ready and finding its way to the parliament to create a constituency for the people of Santo Kofi, Akpa, Fulipe, and Lolobi so they can have a special by election, special by election in court to elect their representatives who will take part in the proceedings of the eighth parliament, not the ninth parliament, because they cannot wait for four years and not have a representative. And it is in the interest of one electoral commission, the interest of Ghana as a country, and the interest of due process that we do this quickly. If we are so afraid of the 47 six, we can come under 298. Okay. So what you're saying is that um, you, Parliament, you, you are, you're going to push for Parliament to what? What, what exactly is the approach? Set, set up a committee to review it? I just want clarity on that. You see, what, what the 298 suggests is that, uh, uh, let me just read it verbatim. Subject okay. to the provision of Chapter 25 of this Constitution, where on any matter, whether arising out of this Constitution or otherwise, there is no provision expressed or by necessary implication of this constitution which deals with the matter that has arisen parliament shall by an act of parliament not being inconsistent with any provision of this constitution provide for that matter to be dealt with mm. so this is a matter that has arisen which has not really been provided for in our constitution that if an area did not take part in an in an otherwise original elections to elect representatives to parliament and a, 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 their parliament has been sworn in. But a CI to create that constituency has equally not been laid in the previous parliament. When the CI is so laid, can an election be conducted in such an area for that member of parliament to participate in this uh, eighth parliament? I think that we can come under 298 and find a resolution to this matter. So, so, so this, 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 so, so, so this will be through an act of parliament? It has to be a, through an act of parliament. And but, so parliament will create a way for electoral commission to be able to create a constituency yeah. for which reason their representative can, can join uh, this, 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 but the this parliament. But there are practical challenges. I mean, in Ghana, acts of parliament always in initiated by the government. And I don't see any appetite on behalf of the government to, to do this. Will you sponsor a private member's bill on this? Oh, sure. That is what, if government is not interested, it means that government is not interested in holding up the rights of its citizens that it's supposed to represent. And we will communicate that clearly to Ghanaians and we'll take other steps to get that down. I, I believe that government should not say that it is not interested in people being represented. Government must be interested. And well, we will force government to be interested. And if government decides that they are not interested, uh, uh, luckily we have a speaker of parliament who is very, very independent. He has independent thoughts. He has his views. And these are things that he will not tolerate, and I believe that an audience with him, uh, you will get something out of it. Prof, what is the most effective course of action now for the people of Sao? Is it through parliament, an act of parliament? Is it through back to the courts to compel the EC, so through a, a lot of mandamus, for example, to create a, const a constituency for them and get them to vote? Or as... Um, it, frankly it says, start with an appeal to the EC to do what they are supposed to do. What was the most effective course of action now? It is an immediate uh, court action. And then seeking emergency reliefs, seeking a mandamus. I, I, I'm enjoying listening to Kofi because his theory is interesting, but it has some problems. You see, it's not as if uh, there's an issue that is not anticipated by the Constitution. 
this issue of representation is duly anticipated by the Constitution. The problem here is that the Constitution has been violated. When the Constitution is violated, you don't go under Article 298 to try to solve it. You go to the court, you seek a declaration that the Constitution has been violated, and you ask the court for consequential orders. So the court can issue a consequential order which says, notwithstanding uh, Article 47, 6, which provides that a new constituency cannot be created when uh, a new parliament has been inaugurated. In this instance, because these folks were prevented from participating in the general election, Article 47, 6 does not apply, and the new constitu constituency should come into being, and the people should be allowed to vote no later than April 15th or April 30th or something like that. This was the path as far back as December 7th, and it remains the only viable path. The issue that is, is if you will get if you get the courts to do what exactly you are saying, but like has been raised earlier, that we have endorsed believe, a lot of constitutional acts. No, I, I believe the courts would do that. You see, if you look at even this um Hawaii case you would notice that the courts, not just the courts, the attorney general, everybody concedes that the constitution has been violated in the case of Sal. There's no person in Ghana today who believes that, boy, what happened in Sal is constitutional. The only challenge we are facing now is, well, how do you remedy the situation? And there are people who tend to think that, well, you cannot remedy it by creating a new constituency because they are reading Article 47.6 and freezing Article 47.6. Article 47.6 says, ceteris paribus, everything remaining the same, everybody participating in an election, a new constituency cannot be created. But what if ceteris is not paribus? What if everything is not the same? What if some people, through no fault of theirs, through the negligence and recklessness of the election manager, are not represented in parliament? Should we just fold our arms? No good judge will say, yeah, just fold your arms and you've run out of luck. Every good judge would direct the EC to solve that problem with dispatch immediately. And I believe that if somebody should go to court tomorrow and say to the court, very simple thing, Mr. Judges, I am a citizen of South. I am a Ghanaian, or I think I'm a Ghanaian, but we have a, a, a parliament, I'm not in parliament, I risked my life, registered as a voter to participate in the parliamentary elections. December 6th, the election, election commissioner directed me not to vote. Here I am in a no man's land. Please help me, Mr. Judge. Every reasonable judge would take that seriously because if you look at our jurisprudence, one thing the Supreme Court doesn't play with and the courts do not play with is the right to vote and the right to representation. Yeah, Every you are. Okay. But yet, uh, the Supreme Court was saying that the right to vote is not a fundamental human right, and that that falls under the directive principles of state policy. You go to court with an issue, and there's an open, clear legality, and the courts do not seem to rule on rule on that. Yeah, but but frankly, we are dealing with separate issues here because. Even though there's an illegality with respect to the SAL issue, it doesn't mean there's an illegality with respect to Hohoi. Those are two separate issues. And I have seen CI-128, I've inspected CI-128, and I believe CI-128 is proper. And I also believe the CI-128 was responsive to the Supreme Court directive in the JATE case. So we have to live with CI-128. The question then becomes, why did the EC itself violate CI 128? And given that the EC has violated CI 128, what is the remedy? And that's what the only issue is. So give us a solution. So and I think that solution can be given. And I think that solution can be given. I agree with you that sometimes the judges are not very careful in making some statements. For instance, to say that right to vote is not fundamental there are series of cases decided by the court, Ten Adi, uh, Ahun Kalinse, a whole bunch of uh, voting jurisprudence where the issue of the fundamentality of the voting rights is now taken for granted. I don't know whether sometimes they don't read these cases or what, but they say things which are just not right. But you have to read the whole decision in totality. When you look at the 
uh, uh, the review of the injunction case and the subsequent review in totality, I tend to agree with their ultimate conclusion. Yeah. Even though I can pick sentences here and there that I disagree with. But if you focus on the big picture, I don't think the Supreme Court erred in saying that the uh, whole Hoi Hoi Court uh, could not have uh, injuncted the uh, Hoi Hoi yeah. uh, from Fra picking Fra his Fra frankly, frankly, let me briefly let me hear you on that, and then I'll go for a break. Well, I mean, I think that when you see of, uh, people's rights being violated of careless abandon, uh, one of the challenges we have in this instance is that we are going up against an constitutional body, so-called the EC, which has been shepherded in its uh, grivial, grivial sins by the Supreme Court. And so for me, it looks as if um, going back to that court again to somehow seek for some <laughs> some reliefs uh, it's unfortunately not the route. I'm, I don't know. Maybe my people will think about it and maybe pursue it. So what Prof is suggesting is that this should be an election petition, really, and not uh, the way we've gone about it. No, I'm suggesting don't focus on Huawei. Just focus on Sal, that Sal is not in parliament. Sal wants to be in parliament. Sal was supposed to be uh, represented in parliament. The EC issued a directive, direct, directive violated administrative rights. It was against due process. It violated their human rights. And so there needs to be a remedy. What is the remedy? You cannot go and undo some of the elections that have already happened. So that, that's out. The only thing, the only remedy left is to create the constituency. So you can like also vote EC for your own. Promise on December 6th. That's all. Yeah. What if we have a very simple. Process. Frankly, does that work? What if you are told that these areas were supposed to be under BOEM according to 128? Yeah, so but the, 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 the people are not saying they are not under BOEM. The EC told them that they are not under BOEM. Let me, just, let me just help with this information. You see, on the 4th of December, the Electoral Commission instructed and made sure, even though they have not advertised and served notice to all the 50 polling stations in the South area that they will be voting under BWIM. On the 4th of December, they got ballot material packaged by their office in Jessica, including the ballot material of parliamentary candidates for BWIM. That's true. Then, on the night of the 5th of December, Electoral Commission, after issuing that matter alone, against my warning, forced open the ballot boxes and removed the parliamentary ballot material from all the 50 ballot boxes. That's true. I know about that. I call them. I called the director of elections, Dr. Sribo Kweku. I called the district and told them if anything happened, we will hold them responsible. Mm. Because we have participated, sent agents, and packaged everything in the 50 ballot boxes, including parliamentary ballot papers from BWIM. But Electoral Commission, just alone, without the presence of our agents, forced open the seals and remove the parliamentary material. That was what they did. I see. They went this far. So today, the Electoral Commission cannot claim that there was some CI and the people should have voted and therefore they didn't vote. So wow. you are the only solution truly is for them to see to it that they create a constituency. Yeah. Luckily, and, 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 and I guess and I guess and, and I guess so. on that on that question is do you, do you compel the EC? I guess that's Prof is saying that you can go to court and get an order of mandamus to compel the EC if they don't want to do it by themselves. Let me take a quick break. When I return, we'll wrap up with uh, Franklin and Prof because I know Kofi has to go back to the chamber. Stay with me. A minute to wrap up, but I, I still want to hear uh, Franklin Kuju on the back of uh, all the suggestions that have come in uh, on how to deal uh, with this uh, matter. Uh, Franklin, is there a certainty that you're going to file uh, a petition to the EC now on this as, as a way of getting them to do what they have to do? I guess it's the very sensible route to take. And then also the 
parliamentary actions will be in place, as well as going to court again. Um, even though on that last one, I do not have my hopes that high. But uh, it's still good to throw everything in there and see which one that which which one will stick. Really. I mean, and, and uh, Prof. So uh, we've been in this country before and seen how cases can run. By the time we realize the next four years had come and the people still don't have representation, would you be scandalized to know that actually happened in this case? Well, yeah, of course, I'll be scandalized, but it wouldn't surprise me if it happened. The problem we have in the country is that there is no institutional accountability. So any public office can get away with almost anything, whether it's constitutional or unconstitutional. If you go and you file a lawsuit, the lawsuit itself is not uh, treated with the seriousness that it deserves. We need some form of change in mindset in how we approach these issues. If you are going to uh, be serious about constitutional regimes, you cannot say you have a constitutional regime and have some people in the country not represented in parliament. And then we are dilly-dallying on what the solution should be. Up till now, I haven't read any statement for the, from the EC acknowledging that it has made a big mistake let alone trying to atone for it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. so what? They, they are not in parliament. Big deal. That's the attitude. And Prof. that has to change yeah. because we got to start holding people accountable. Prof, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Franklin, and then Kofi as well. We'll see how this pans out. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening.